if if you used to pray, if you, if you think about your current situation, the things that you have now, you used to pray for those things. We used to pray for those doors to open, and now we're here, and we we forget, don't we, that we once yearn for these things and now we have them so can we just be grateful for what we have if of course it's absolutely fine to want more and to aspire for more of course not it's just human nature for us to um socially mobilize we always want to get to the next level and that's absolutely fine but in order to get to that level we have to be grateful we have to be grateful so guys um welcome to our property and finance hour. Um, it's a weekly thing. It doesn't always happen every single week, but it's something that we aspire to do every single week. At one point, it was just me trying to do all the sessions, but now we have guest speakers um, and we just try to add value. We're, we're more than just a trading company. We, we, we're more than just um, you know making money on the charts. We try to give value and property and finance is at the very heart of AMA Finance Academy. AMA Finance Academy started off as a commercial finance company and then moved into just finance in general. We've, we've helped thousands of people to buy, buy their first home, to get on the ladder, to expand their portfolio and so forth. So guys, I wanna go straight into to this week's session. Um, now the property and finance hour is pure value. And today I'm gonna be introducing um, our guest speakers. Now, today he's a guest speaker, but all things being well, I'm trying to lock him down to be a regular speaker. If not every single week, then, you know, every other week or whatever it may be, but we're in negotiations right now. And the reason why I want to lock him down is because he has so much knowledge and wisdom. Um, he was one of our in-house finance um, guys for AMA Finance, for AMA Finance. We were originally AMA Finance before we were AMA Finance Academy. And when we were AMA Finance, we partnered with this individual to be our in-house finance guy. And it was an absolute pleasure to have him as part of the team because not only was, you know, there were not many people who, was, who were as um, talented as me when it came to, you know, doing mortgage deals and getting deals over the line. But I think that this, this guy, I'll probably say, was, was, was up there with me, you know, <laughs> if, I may, if I may say so myself. No, in fact, you know, he probably surpassed me. His, his knowledge of the industry is absolutely insane. What he's been able to do for many clients, who, many of whom are actually in the academy right now, has been, has been incredible. When it comes to mortgage broking, a good mortgage broker could be the difference between you getting a house and not getting a house. Trust me. You know, many people try to go it alone, but if you have someone who knows the system, they can get it over the line for you. Just, just, just having relationships with underwriters is such a powerful thing. So guys, that being said, he's more than just mortgages. This guy, when it comes to personal finance, when it comes to managing money, if you, you only have to go onto his Instagram page to see the nuggets and the wisdom and the value that this guy gives out every single day. He's impacted thousands and thousands of people across the UK. Now, today I invite him on to share with us some wisdom when it comes to managing your credit score. Just put a two in the chat box. If you've ever had a little blemish on your credit score, you know, I'm going to put my two in first of all. My two is going in straight away. If, you, if you've ever had a little blemish, and, and, and I'm being cute when I say little blemish. Some of you have got like big fat, um, what's, the, what's the term I'm looking for here? You know, <laughs> I remember when I turned 18 and I, and I got, um, I applied for a case catalogue. Who, who remembers case catalogue and Littlewoods? I've got a case catalogue. I've got a, a Littlewoods catalogue. Guys, it was a wrap. It was a wrap. You know, I just, I got carried away. Should we just say that? And I didn't really understand how it all worked, right? So I kind of fell behind on my payments. And next thing you know, like, this was back when I was 18, right? So next thing you know, I had a default. And I'm like, what the hell is that? No one ever tells you about this stuff, right? They don't teach you this stuff at school. They don't say, don't do this and this might happen. I didn't understand the impact of it, you know? And, you know, I had to deal with all of that. Obviously, six years later, that's that. Well, I dealt with that. Six years later, it was removed from my credit file, and I never looked back. Right to be a mortgage broker, you have to have a squeaky clean credit um, credit score. But let me look at these blemishes. So a few people got a few few blemishes. Uh, acne, a stain, <laughs> pimples. Um, guys, so some of us have struggled. Some of us, some of us are probably in a really bad credit situation right now, and sometimes it can feel really unfair. Right, you know, it can because here's the reality. 
do you know how many clients, here's the reality, right? Do you know how many clients I've had that have come to me for a mortgage? And I can get them the mortgage, but because their credit is so bad, I can get them the mortgage. You know, here's the myth. People think you can't get a mortgage when you've got bad credit. No, you can. It's just that you're going to pay a premium. I've, had, I've got clients' mortgages. They've had six CCJs and, and more. So it's not the, that's, that, that, that's not the thing. It's just that you're going to pay a premium. So you're going to end up with a, with a, a lender who's going to char, charge you more. You're going to pay a high interest rate. So to put it into context, I had a, I had a person who, who, because of their credit score, they were paying 1600 a month for their mortgage. But if it wasn't for that credit issue, I would have been able to get them with a high street lender and they would have only paid about 800 pounds a month or 869. So do you see the difference? So sometimes it can feel really unfair that you're already struggling financially, yet you're having to pay more, right? Or, or you can't even get the thing that you want. Like you go to a store, a department store, and you try to get something on credit and the computer says no, you know? So who agrees with me that if you could get some wisdom and some nuggets for how you can improve your credit or maintain your good credit, it would be beneficial. Just put, put a free in the chat box if you think that would be beneficial to, to get that kind of wisdom on how to improve your credit, how to maintain your credit, because the guy I'm about to introduce is gonna give you the secret sauce, okay? He's gonna share his experience with you. So without further ado, I would like you to give a nice, warm Ame Finance Academy welcome to Clarence, and that is gonna be a household name Clarence Kiyoro. Clarence Kiyoro, yes, made you co host. Yes, That's thank you, man. That's thank you, thank you, thank you. I can't lie. When you, when you introduced me, I felt like one of those pastors in the church is like the guest preacher. <laughs> so <laughs> you've made me feel good. So I appreciate you, man. I can see all the comments at the bottom as well. So thank you. And yeah, I guess, you know, Des has, Des has said some really good stuff, you know. Des has said some really good stuff. And as a mortgage broker, probably one of the most frustrating things really is when you you kind of speak to a client and you, you know, you hear their income, they have the deposit, everything all sounds great. And then before you know it, you do a credit check and you find out that, you know, it's not going to go through, even though they told you that the credit was squeaky clean. So um, the reason that I'm actually, well, I've done a video on this already. So everyone, please feel free to go to my Instagram. My name is um, CK Talks Money on Instagram and the reason I find this so important is because I have loads of friends and even family members that have come to me in the past and they've said yeah you know you want to get a mortgage you know but my credit is just I've had a CCJ in my credit card and I'm just like how does everyone actually get in these situations when I now start offloading information on these people I realize that it's a lot well, a lot of the time it's a it's a lack of knowledge so it's a it, it's a lack of not knowing exactly what it is that benefits your credit and what it is that, you know, makes your credit get lower. So I just feel like it's, it's extremely important. Of course, having a deposit is great. Um, affordability is a big part of a mortgage application. So of course, ensuring that you have a good income and your income all matches up for the criteria. But like Des said, um, you can have high credit and, you know, then somebody could have low credit and still get a mortgage but the premium you're going to be paying it's not going to be attractive and I've had people who have had to fall into higher rates as a result of their credit file and they've literally said to me you know what I wish I had just you know waited not bought the house carried on renting or lived at my mum's and just worked on my credit first rather than jumping into this so your credit is important I know this is a property and finance um, session, but it's not just about property and finance. You know, Des was talking about stories. So I guess I'll share a story of my own now. When I was in 2015, I went into a car dealership to get a car on finance, you know, so I'd gone online and, you know, I looked at the rate, it was 6.9. I thought, yeah, like that sounds, that sounds fine. Went in there, looked at the payments they were giving me for the car. It's a BMW 1 series, you know, so, I know what I was expecting to be paying. And to be honest, when, when the guy told me how much I was going to be paying, I literally wanted to lie down on the floor because I was thinking that's not what I saw online. But of course, when you use those calculators online, those are all subject to you having a satisfactory credit score and you know being eligible for those rates. So I guess what I want to get into today is good and bad credit score habits. You know, So um, 
I know Des was doing this whole one, two, three, four thing. So let me see if it works when I do it as well. I don't know if it only works when Des does it. <laughs> but if you have any sort of lending, credit card, mortgage, overdraft, car finance, just put a one in the chat section just so I can see who I'm kind of... Okay. Okay, so, yeah, that's quite a lot of people. So everyone has some sort of debt call. So some of the terminologies I'm using, if you don't understand it, please just um, let me know or feel free to drop me a DM on my Instagram as well. Yep. Yeah, so. I think the biggest thing that I'm going to start on is credit cards because um, there's something called credit card, sorry, there's something called credit utilization. Yep. So this forms about 30 to 35% of your overall credit score. What is credit utilization is, and I'm sure you might have all heard this in the past where people say, oh yeah, just, you know, you want to make your credit better, take out a credit card, use the whole balance and then just pay it off at the end of the month. Now, um, in my last video that I did on Instagram, I called that myth number one, because it's not true. That's not how the system works, you know? So with credit utilization, what it does is, it's the difference between what your credit limit is and your outstanding balance. Now, credit rating agencies, so those are like the um, experience, Equifaxes, you know, the people that you go to to kind of check your credit score. They recommend that you use about 20 to 30% of your credit limit. Reason for that is because when they're looking at you from a credit perspective and they're trying to decipher if you are, you know, if, if your credit worthiness is good enough for them to give you any sort of lending, what they like to see is that you do have availability to use money that's been lent to you. So let's say that's a credit card, but they don't want to see that you're reliant on that money. So they want to see that you can use it efficiently. So let's say you're limit was £1,000. What's recommended is that you use no more than two to £300 of that limit. And gradually what that will do over time is that builds up your credit can and will increase due to your, due to your credit activity and how you're using your account. Yeah. So that is probably the biggest one that I'll give you now. The, probably the most obvious one that a lot of people... I would say the one that you have most control over, but I feel as if whenever I meet people and they've had issues with this, it always seems to quote unquote, not be their fault or be a mistake is mispayments, you know? So mispayments is the, probably the easiest way to keep your, keep your credit at a good level and maintain your score, but also probably the easiest way to ruin your credit. You know, this could be on a mobile phone contract. This could be on a, a mortgage on a car, even on a credit card. So let's say, for example, for those of you who put ones in there because you have credit cards where you get that letter in the post or text to your phone to say, yeah, this is your minimum payment. Please pay this amount by um, this date, for example. So missing those payments, for those of you who are familiar, you, you'll know what this looks like on your credit report. You will see like a chart of your credit history with a specific lender. And that lender will log every time you miss a payment. Now, if we're going to refer this back to property and finance, when you're applying for a mortgage, one of the questions that's asked, and sometimes one of the biggest reasons why people are actually declined for a mortgage is because they've had missed payments. So once again, that could be on any, any um, credit agreement that they have on their file. Because once again, when we're, when we're talking about credit worthiness and the mortgage lender is, you know, looking at your file and trying to see if they're going to, you know, be willing to give you the money they want to see that you are a reliable lender and a reliable lender, for example, pays money that they borrowed. So in my last video, I kind of used an analogy as to say, let's say that you gave a, you know, you gave a friend some money, gave a friend a hundred pounds and they told you, yep, I'm going to pay you five pounds for the next, however long it is to pay you back. Yep. If they then miss payments or they don't pay you back in a year, they pay you back in two years. The next time that person asks you for money, you're not going to view them as a reliable person to lend money to because they're going to seem as if they're not fit for paying that money back. You know, so miss payments is probably the easiest way to maintain your credit, but also a very easy way for you to ruin your credit if things aren't kept up to date. Yep. So this is one question that I was asked and it was quite surprising because I did a poll on my Instagram, I think last week, and I asked people literally just straightforward, who's actually checked their credit file before? Is there anyone here that hasn't, hasn't actually checked their credit file before or hasn't checked it in a long time? Just give me a number one in the chat box. Okay. Okay, so there's a few. Not in ages, yeah, okay, that's a few. There's a few, so, okay. 
Okay. So I have a video on this anyway, but the places that you could go to to check your, you're too scared. <laughs> That's hilarious. The places you could go to to check your credit file. So my favorite is Experian. Um, why? I find that it's very user friendly. It's easy to read and it's very clear. Also, I don't know if there's a reason for this, but for me personally, my Experian credit file has always been the most up to date in comparison to the others. So Experian is one, exa is, is one, is one place you can go to. There's also ClearScore. So just in case anybody's writing these down who haven't checked their credit file before, I won't rush through these. There's also a site called Credit Karma. And there's one called Equifax, which is E-Q-U-I-F-A-X. So those are the best places to go to check your credit file. One thing I would also encourage, because this is something that I've come across in my days doing mortgages as well, is that if, if you're one of the people that said that you haven't checked it in a while, I would say even if you're not looking to apply for a mortgage or any sort of lending, I would fully recommend that you check it. Reason being, I've seen many scenarios whereby people haven't checked their file in a while and there's actually something on their file that they didn't know about. So, you know, God forbid someone's taken your details and opened an account and done whatever they've done. You wouldn't have been aware of that, you know? So also, let's say lenders that you do use and, you know, let's say your mortgage provider or your credit card provider they might sometimes, which I've seen happen quite a few times, actually happened to my father, actually, that they log information incorrectly, which means that you checked your credit score two years ago and everything was fine. And the last thing you know was that, yeah, your credit's squeaky clean, there's no issues, but there might be some information on there that's incorrect, which is probably my biggest reason for constantly checking my credit file. My biggest reason is to ensure that the information that's being reported about me to the lenders that i'm planning to use or lenders that i'm using is actually correct so it's just like you know it's just like a way of cross-referencing usually when you go on these sites there is something called a notice of correction whereby if you do find anything on there that's incorrect you can actually send a message over to them to say look this says this but it shouldn't be a mispayment for example i made this payment here's the proof of it if you also do see anything on your credit file let's say you have a credit card with lloyd's and They've told you that you haven't made your May or your June payments. You can actually call Lloyd's directly and just say, look, my credit file says this wasn't made, but your, your statement that you've sent me says that the payment was made. That is something that you can do just to ensure that your credit file is always in check because this is probably the one of the most important tools that you'll have, if not the most important tool that you'll need to make sure is all straightened out when you're actually applying for a mortgage. Sorry, someone just said something. You haven't checked for a while because you don't have any credit cards. Okay, that's absolutely fine. So that's Chair Lady 500. Yeah, to be honest, I've heard that quite a lot, Chair Lady 500. You know, a lot of people have said to me that I don't have anything on, I don't have any credit outstanding and I also don't plan to take out any credit, so there's no point checking. So I would still recommend that you check it out. Because if you heard the example that I gave earlier, it's just even from a, a point of security for yourself, you know? It's, uh, yeah, it's like Joey Cholia, exactly. People could be doing things on your name. And that's what I was saying earlier about it's key that you, even if you just check it, you know, once every so often, at least then you're aware of what's going on rather than just being completely oblivious to it, you know? So I would fully recommend Chair Lady 500 that if you do get a chance, just log on to any of the sites that I've mentioned and just try and have a look at that you know it's i think a lot a lot of them are free now you know it's clear score i know is free credit karma i know is free i think experian is the one whereby you can have a monthly they have a free option now actually they do they have a free option but there's also an option to pay 15 pounds a month if you wish to go deeper into it yeah so yeah exactly someone just said that they pay for the monthly one as well so yeah so those are my main tips on using credit cards it's a killer every month 15 pounds yeah joey <laughs> yeah joey so it's, it's 15 pounds but it's 15 pounds that could do you a lot of favors you know that 15 pounds would have probably gone to you know i don't know if you're a drinker but maybe a bottle of whiskey or something so <laughs> it, is, it is something that's worth doing it's something that's worth doing and you know i think i feel that a lot of the people that i spoke to said they hadn't checked it their main reason was because they've never had a reason to 
they've never had a reason to look at it they've never tried to take out a credit card but on that front i have a very good friend of mine that recently came to me and said ck how can i increase my credit i've never had a credit card all i've ever had is a current card i've never had anything and that was his reason as to why his credit was slightly lower so in that sense he couldn't the credit cards he was applying for he wasn't accepted for because his score was really low due to having literally no credit history so what he had to do is take out what's called a credit builder card so a credit build a credit card and what that does is they'll usually give you quite a small limit so i think most times we'll start at anything between 250 to 500 pounds sometimes even just 150 pounds and all you do you just use it for small transactions here and there and you just pay it off every month just to kind of create some sort of record of you making payments on your credit file yep so those are the main points i think another one that i think is very important especially for people who feel that they have applied for credits in the past and they haven't been accepted was avoid excess credit searches so what i'd advise is and this once again comes back to property and finance and applying for a mortgage if you've applied for a, a lending facility and you've been declined yeah the worst thing that you can do is go on every other lender's site and constantly apply. Because every time that they do a credit check on you, it leaves a footprint on your credit file. I think some of you, for those that do check their credit file, you will have noticed that whenever you open a credit card or even a current account that, that, where there's no lending attached to it, whenever you open any sort of account on your credit file, your credit score always takes a, a slight dip. Now, that's not because you opening an account is a bad thing. It's strictly because when you open a new account, the credit rating agency and the bank has no record of how you've managed that specific account. So until they've seen that you have managed this account, you know, efficiently in the way that it should be, then your score will gradually come back up to where it went to. So I think when I opened an account, it, it only went down by about I think, 10 to 15 points. But once I had the account for three months, three months, four months, then it started to slowly, slowly come back up. Yeah, so that is something else that I would say you should watch out for. If you do open an account and you're wondering why your score goes down, that is the reason for it. But like I said, if you are then declined for any sort of facility, it is key that you, the first thing I would recommend that you do is, like I said earlier, get hold of a credit report. Clear score, someone said earlier, is actually free. So just get hold of your credit report, have a look at it. I actually run a service whereby I review people's credit files for them if it's something that they have an issue with and we can look at it and try and strip down exactly why, you know, they might have been declined for a facility or why their, you know, credit credit application might have been rejected. So usually it could be anything from, from, from any of the things that we've mentioned. It could be the way that you use the credit that you have already. It could be the fact that, you know, you've never really had credits in the past, you know, or it could be CCJs. It could be, I've seen very, I've seen very few situations where people's credit file has actually been compromised and people have, you know, behind their back or without them knowing opened cards and overdrafts under their name so that is something that does happen so if you were one of the people that said that you don't check it or you haven't checked it in a long time i would encourage that you do have a look at it and do you know just at least to make sure that everything is in check just to make sure that you um have a look at it just to you know give you that peace of mind after today's after today's chat as well yeah so des that is me sorry how do you find that if you have a CCJ? So it will actually be on the credit file. So I'm, I'm, speaking, I'm speaking from um, looking at experience, but one of the last boxes at the bottom of the um, Experian credit reports, it will literally say it. The CCJ will be right there. Credit Karma is also one that I use. For, for those who have used Noddle in the past, Credit Karma is what Noddle used to be. So they've actually changed their name. The CCJs are listed on your um, credit report. Yep, so when you do have a CCJ, they will be visible there and you will be able to see them. No worries, Joyce. I'll let's get a word about the cut. Miss Reds. Okay, so Miss Reds has just asked a question. I think what I'll do, Miss Reds, because I think I've just realized that you've asked that question privately. So I'll just take a snap of that. And if you could just send me a message straight to my Instagram page, which is CK Talks Money, I'll answer that question privately as well. Yeah. 
You're welcome, Joyce. Does anybody have any more questions at all? Guys, feel free to ask any questions that you have whilst we have him on this week um, dealing with this particular subject. Any um, credit score questions, um, feel free to unmute your mic and ask them directly or you can put them in the chat box. Okay, so we've got, why does it take longer for your credit to rise? <laughs> Is that JAMA? Yeah, JAMA. Uh, JAMA, yep. JAMA, Jam, yeah. Okay, so why does it take longer for your credit to rise? So really, it's a thing whereby, I guess it depends. If you're somebody who has, like I said earlier, has never really had credit at all, and you're trying to get a better credit, um, get a better credit score, it won't take you as long as somebody who has kind of had an average score made loads of mistakes on their credit file and then is trying to get it back up. Um, reason for that, I guess the best word I can use to describe that is trust. You know, um, the, 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 way, the way the bank kind of looks at it is, you know, like we trusted you with this money or let's say another bank would say, okay, so they trusted you with this money and, you know, you didn't pay it back or you missed payments. So it does gradually take more time for you to build up that credit trust again because they want to minimize risk as much as possible. So when they're looking at lending you money, the bank is taking and, you know, some sort of risk when they're actually saying, yes, you know, we're going to give you this money and we're expecting that as a result of giving you this money, you're going to pay it back. So if you have a past of, like I used the analogy earlier about giving a friend money and them not paying it back, it's going to take some time for them to build that trust back up, which is why it takes slightly longer for your credit to go up when you've actually had some bad information registered on it in the past i hope that's clear as well by the way amazing 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 um and then we have what's a bad score as in you won't get a mortgage um, right okay that's leah leah that's from leah leah leah's iphone yeah cool so leah a bad score for a mortgage so what would be amazing is if every bank said you need to have at least this number on your credit score to get a mortgage Unfortunately, that's not the case. Reason being, when you're applying for a mortgage, and you're, for example, even just a credit check in general, a credit check isn't so much about the number. All that number does for you on a credit rating agency, it just indicates where you are in, in relation to their idea of an excellent score. When you're applying for a mortgage, for example, specifically, it's more so about your credit history and what you've had in the past, which is why when I, spoke, when I spoke earlier about the mispayments and stuff like that, it's more so about your credit activity. So um, for example, this is a very good example. I have a friend, two friends who have very similar scores. Yeah, they have very similar scores. One hasn't had much credit, one has. They both applied for a mortgage, one's been accepted, one's been declined. Reason being, the guy who was declined has previously had a CCJ. Now the CCJ was only about, let's say two, three years ago. Yeah. So as a result of that credit history on his report, that was why he was declined. So when your when your um, mortgage application goes to an underwriter um, at, a, at, at a mortgage lender, they actually reviewed the history of your credit as well as the score. So it's not just the score that, yep, yeah, if they have this score, they're going to be accepted. Unfortunately, it's not that straightforward and simple. It's more so about the actual history of your credit. No worries, Leo. Amazing, amazing. One thing I remember from my mortgage broken days were when things were like really fresh. So if somebody came to me and they, they just got a CCJ, um, yeah. needed a bit of time for that to pass. You know, it's, it's, you could actually get Correct. a mortgage with, with I mean, CCJs, other than um, bankruptcy, IVAs, uh, CCJs, yeah. they're fairly severe. And, you know, we, we, we were getting people mortgages with several CCJs, but time had passed yeah. a little bit. So, again, it comes back to trust. So, okay, trust was broken, but you're showing that, you know, time has gone by. Improve, and yeah. You've been more responsible. And one thing to bear in mind that mortgages are actually a, a safer loan for, for banks because they're able to... Um, they're able to secure the loan against the property. So worst yeah. case scenario for the bank, 
they can take the property back via repossession uh, and sell it on to, to get their money back. So it yeah. is it's less risky for them to give you a mortgage than to give you an unsecured loan of let's say uh, 40, 50K that you could potentially just not pay back with the house there, their money's secure. So that's why there are companies out there that will, or mortgage partners that will give you the mortgage if you've got you know quite bad credit because it's actually secured, but you are paying yeah. a premium for that. Exactly. So you can um, get, and that's why I kind of gave you an example earlier of the person who said, look, I wish I just worked on my credit rather than taking out this mortgage because I could have just built my credit up for six months and then got a cheaper rate rather than paying this crazy premium that they, that they were paying, you know? Amazing. Okay, this question here from, from, from Jackie. Um, is there a better strategy after one goes through bankruptcy? Is there a better strategy after one goes through bankruptcy? To be honest, I think the best way to kind of tackle that really is just, it just, it just depends on the amounts will play a part in terms of your bankruptcy. And also your activity on your credit file after that would also play a part as well. So I've had people who have gone through bankruptcy and they've, you know, been unable to open, you know, even accounts. When I was at Metro Bank, they were unable to open current accounts and everything like that. I think something like that is more something that's more specific in terms of, it's more specific rather than being a general answer because the circumstances for everyone who goes through bankruptcy would be slightly different. So ja Jackie Harakis was, yeah? Yes. If you, yeah, Jackie Harakis, if you can literally just drop me a message, I think Des sent my... um. Um, my details at the bottom earlier so if you just drop me a um, direct message what I can do I can even set up a call with you and what we'll do we'll look at the circumstances if that is your circumstance anyway and we can have a conversation about it I think Natalie Red's also asked a question um, so Natalie also please feel, feel free to drop me a message afterwards I think you're asking for individual advice on credit scores so yeah feel free absolutely I'll absolutely. just I'll just put my stuff in there as well. Sorry. Once, once you've like gone through bankruptcy and you've, and the seven years has elapsed, um, you know you start to build your credit back up slowly but surely. You know they're, um, you know obviously, it's a catch twenty two trying to get credit when you don't have a good credit score. It's tough sometimes, but there are some, yeah, you know, credit cards out there like Vanquist and Aqua. Correct. That, yeah. that you can get those kind of credit cards and and just start to rebuild your credit. You know, credit cards can be a force of good if you're using it in the right way. You know, right. just using it for things that you were going to buy anyway, pay it back in full, you know, manage it, manage it well. And then your credit will start to shoot up. It will start to it'll start yeah. to go up. Okay. So we've got one here from JP. Um, is there anything that can be done after the fact of getting a CCJ, i.e. appeal process, etc.? And what is the chances of success if you appeal via the courts, etc.? cetera? Um, does it matter if the amount of the CCJ is nominal? in relation to an otherwise excellent um, profile. Before um, you, you come on to that, Clarence, I just want to yeah. um, give a quick tip to everyone. Guys, if you get a CCJ and you pay it within the first 28 days, it's like it's never happened. Right. And a lot of people forget that. It's like, it, it's like you never had it. So if yeah. you ever get a CCJ, just remember that. Because what a lot of people do is they procrastinate, they bury their head in the sands. After that 28 days, that CCJ is not going, going anywhere. It could be satisfied, but it's yeah. not going anywhere. But within 28 days, if you pay that, that's gone. Every credit yeah. file, all your credit files, it's gone legally. So that's a little tip there. Um, over to you, Clarence. Yes, I think you were saying, um, does it um, get a CCS? Does it affect an excellent score? To be honest, regardless of JP Skeet, sorry, um, regardless of an excellent profile or whatever your score is, a CCJ will affect you either way. Of course, if you do pay it off in the first 28 days, like Des said, then, you know, it's, it's like it never really took place. But as you probably are aware, it stays in your file for six years. Um, so it will be removed after six years, whether um, in, if you, you know, don't pay off in the first 28 days. So that's the first thing that I will say. In terms of the actual matter of, um, does it matter of the amounts, even if the amount is, you know, the amount is something silly. Like, you know, I've had friends who have had CCJs for things like £60 in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the eyes of a credit rating agency and a mortgage application, it holds the same way. Because where we talk again about trust and credit worthiness, they're looking at that as you've owed money to an organisation and refused to pay. So regardless, it will still hold the same effect. Let's say you were applying for a mortgage, whether it was a £500 or a £60 CCJ. 
it would be the same thing. It would, it would have the same effect. Just, just to um, add on to that as well, it looks far better if you satisfy a CCJ than if you leave it unsatisfied. So yeah. something like that, pay it, have it satisfied. Because then when we're talking to lenders, a satisfied one always looks a lot better. We can, we can get a much better rate from, because we, we, we'll do, we do a search, we'll search the whole market. And if you've got a satisfied CCJ compared to an unsatisfied one, you're going to be able to attract slightly better rates, slightly better um, lenders. Um, and also a lot of lenders will say, okay, cool. Um, we'll give you one rate if, you know, if, if it's this amount that you've, that you've, um, that your CCJ is worth. But if it's a bigger amount that your CCJ is worth, then it could affect the rate as well. Um, and there's also one thing I like about brokers is that there's a human element to it. So there are yeah. times when I can pick up the phone to an underwriter that I've built a relationship with and try and get it over the line. Like, look, come on, that CCJ is only 20 pound. You know, I know, I know this client really well. And, you know, and as much as it may seem like everything is very computerized and very much computer says yes, computer says no. No, when you've got a good broker who has a relationship with the underwriter, yeah. you can have those conversations where there's a human element where, you know, something you can just get over the line. If it's something, so if it's very, very, very nominal, you know, it, it, there could be an argument to be had. But, you know, trust has been broken, but there's still, still ways around. Yeah, exactly. Okay. The next question was from Christine. How does living abroad affect your affect your credit score? For example, working abroad for two years. Yeah. Okay. So living abroad. Let's say, for example, you've left the UK. Your credit score is at seven hundred and fifty points on Experian, and you live abroad. One thing that I would say, because I've heard I've had an argument with my friend about this before, so I'll just make this clear: your credit score doesn't follow you. <laughs> is if you if you've gone abroad your credit score isn't also going to mean that when you go abroad your credit score over there is going to be great because you have a great one in the UK it doesn't um, work like that now if you have UK accounts let's say when you've moved abroad you have um, UK credit cards with Lloyd's or whoever you have them with and you continue to you know use them in the right way your credit score should still be maintained provided that there's no issues with your credit file while you're away I think the only time that I've seen a situation where somebody's credit score was affected as a result of moving abroad was because they were no longer on the electoral register. And as, as a lot of people do know, being on the electoral register does also help your credit score slightly um, slightly as well. So in regards to moving abroad, that's, that's, um, that's what I could give you on that. Amazing. Um... CCJs to drop off, Nicola? Yeah, how long does it how take for CCJs to drop off and are they still visible after the after they drop off the file? So it's usually six years. Six years is usually the time frame that CCJs stay on your credit file and they should drop off. So I have had situations where after the six years, the CCJ has stayed on there and all the client literally had to do was get in touch with the business that applied the CCJ or, or write them an email or a letter and they just removed it. So um, it should be six years. It can feel like a long six years, right? When you're for real, yeah, in a situation like that. But it does come around, guys. It does. When I when I st yeah, it, it does come around. Um, if you pay off all your credit, will your credit go up instantly? Now, that's actually a very good question. Very good question. It depends on the amount. It also depends on what your credit score is already like. Reason I say that is because from personal experience, when I paid off my car, for example. It was a big debt, paid it off. My credit score did go up quite quickly. Now, whether it goes up instantly, what most lenders will tell you is that every last working day of the month, they report back to the credit rating agency. Because of that, I say you should literally give about, I don't know, four to, four to eight weeks when looking for real um, updates on your credit real live updates on your credit file, should I say. Reason being is because what they have to do is they have to satisfy your account first. Let's say it's a car finance or credit card. They have to satisfy your account, yeah? Then at the end of that month, what they'll do, they'll send information to the credit rating agency to say, yeah, this person has satisfied this debt. Um, they no longer owe us this money. The credit rating agency then updates your file on their system. And then by the time you look at your credit file at the end of that second month, usually it should be updated now. There's nothing to say that it won't happen quicker, but there's also nothing to say that it might not take longer. 
But what I would say is that, and this is why I spoke earlier about the notice of corrections and constantly checking your credit file, because these are the sorts of things that you need to know and keep track of in the event that you are paying off your debts. Fantastic. Um, from my personal experience as well, I remember when um, my, credit, my credit score wasn't great. And the reason why it wasn't great in this particular period was because I, what you mentioned earlier, Terence, where you have, I was um, using a, a very large percentage of my available credit. So I was basically balance, maxed yeah. up to the hills. All my credit cards were maxed, um, loans, it, everything was maxed. And then, yeah. you know, um, um, was able to get a, a large chunk of money, was able to pay off. And literally on my um, refresh date, the date that everything kind of refreshed, it literally yeah. just shot up. That's a yeah. personal experience. It just shot. Exactly. I was so that like, yeah. happy. It was like an overnight thing. One minute it was like average, and the next minute it was like super high. It skipped exactly. a rank. It literally skipped a rank. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, and yeah. So yeah, that's just a little personal testimony there. All right, what we got here? I was uh, JP's was sixty pounds. Um, just, just is it best to pay off all your debts? Is it best to pay? Is it best to pay off all your debts? Right. Is it best to pay off all your debts? So, someone like myself who constantly looks at debts, and I'm the kind of person that you'll that you'll catch having a conversation about good and bad debt. If any human being is in a position to have money in their account and have no debt whatsoever and have a great credit score, I'm sure that they would. But I guess more so when you have lending, like for example, a credit card, it's more about how you manage it. If your aim for your credit file is just to maintain a good credit score, let's say your credit score out of the 999 on Experian is at 900. If your aim is literally just to maintain that credit score, then you have the option of either. You have the option of, you know, to either just pay off all your debts and have no debt, or you have the option to continue using your credit card to try and get your score higher. Now, if you're somebody who is in the, let's say the poor section on the credit file, and you do have the money to pay off your debt, and let's say you have some spare savings and you're not doing anything with the money, and you ask me, look, I have this money, but I have this debt that I can use my savings to pay off, what should I do? I would recommend paying off the debt for that person. Reason being, if that person has a poor credit score and they, let's say, aspire to buy a property or you know, um, invest in some property, they're gonna need a good credit score. So them having the cash, but having a low credit score but then also having the debts does not benefit them in any way. So I guess that question depends on your circumstances, Joseph, and what your plans are for your finances, really. But I would recommend paying off debt. If you don't, if you don't need to have the debt, and if the debt is, you know, kind of like a constant monthly expense for you and you don't need to, you know, use it, then I would recommend paying it off. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. Um, would you also, um, this is from Tell, would you also have to wait seven years after having a default to apply for a mortgage? No. Right, okay, so what I would say about that, most of the time, lenders are most interested in recent credit activity. Now, that's not to say that you can definitely get a um, mortgage if you have a default after seven years. Usually from criteria, does correct me if I'm wrong, the, the, the longest term I've seen lenders ask if you've had a default is usually 24 months. Is that, is that, is that still the case, Des, would you say? Or have um, you seen the longer? Longest, the longest time. Yeah. Um, what is in, um, how long you've had it for? When, yeah, in terms of when last you had the default. Because there are lenders. I remember people like V, like um, V the home loans, you know, as long as, as long as you've had the default for longer than two years, they would be willing to, you know, still give you the mortgage. So I guess that all depends on the lender that you use. And it goes back to what Des was saying earlier, Tao, about criteria. And the criteria for every lender would be different. So there are lenders that would, if you have a default end of, would definitely say, yeah, you know what, we can't give you a mortgage. But it depends on the kind of lender that you're going for. But the lenders that would most likely give you the mortgage, you should usually be prepared to pay slightly higher. I guess the answer to your question is no, that you don't have to wait seven years before you apply for a mortgage. And you know, lenders on the market. This was one. Of, this is one of my biggest frustrations in the yeah. industry is that for a lot of people, this is what they do. This is what a lot of people do. They go, well, let's 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 they say let's buy a house. Okay, let's 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 get on a yeah. property ladder. So what people do is they 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 toddle off to their their local bank, and they 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 apply for a mortgage, and the the, the um, bank says no, and then they go, 
okay, cool. Let's not. They just give up. That's the end of their yeah, mind journey. And that's what most people do. You'd be shocked how many people think that's the end of it because they've got a, yeah. because they've got a default. And if you go to a high street bank and you've got a default, chances are they probably they may or may not, but the chances are high street banks. If you think of lenders as tiers, so you've got tier one lenders, which are like your high street banks, your Barclays, your Nationwide, your NatWest. They're tier ones. They're like, they're, they're, they're like really prime. They're prime lenders. Yeah. Then you've got tier two, which are kind of like the off high street online banks, um, banks that you may or may not have heard of. Like yeah, building societies, money, and, building all that societies sort of stuff. and stuff like that. Yeah. Then you've got tier three. Now tier three are what we call subprime mortgages. Subprime okay. mortgages are companies who their whole business model is to um, give mortgages to people who have imperfect credit. That's their Correct. client base. That's their, that's their target audience. So they obviously charge a bit more. That's their business model. So if you've got a default, please do not let that put you off buying a house. Just exactly. see a good mortgage broker and, and, and let them do the search because you'll be shocked. And then you have to then weigh up. Can you afford the higher, you know, just, the last, just, last, just early last year, uh, early this year, sorry, I did one for my uncle. Um, and yeah, it was, you know, slightly higher, but he had to, he had to swallow it because he wanted that property. And, exactly. you know, yeah. over time, in, in good conditions with property prices going up as they tend to do anyway, you know, when you kind of do the calculations, yes, you're paying a bit extra, but overall you're still kind of up. So you kind of do the numbers and work out whether it's still a good move to do, but don't let having an imperfect credit put you off. You know, certainly don't just go to yeah. a bank, hear no and give up, get, get yourself a good broker. Good broker could be the difference between you getting the property, not getting a property, getting a good rate, not getting a good rate. Right. Exactly. And I'll fully, and I'll, I'll fully second that because even from my experience of working in, firstly, I started in banking, then I went into mortgage broking. And in the bank, like they said, it's literally, uh, this is our tick sheet. If you don't meet one of these tick boxes, we can't do anything for you. Whereas when you see a broker, your options open up a lot more. And even from a point of view of time, on how time consuming it is, it is also more time consuming for you to see a broker because imagine you're reviewing. It's a bit like when you go on your car insurance um, comparison sites and you're reviewing all the insurers on the market rather than just going to each one individually. So I'll second what Des said and also try and see a broker rather than, you know, doing one application in your local high street bank and being rejected and then giving up, you know. Absolutely. Um, Tamer, does your credit score go up when the CCJ comes off? Absolutely. But I'll let Clarence... It yeah, it will go up gradually. I'm not saying expect an absolute crazy increase or a shoot up, but gradually as you continue to manage your credit file and, you know, hopefully have better credit habits, then yeah, definitely it will go up. It will go up. From Leah, what do you consider a good credit score? A good credit score. So by my standard, well, to be honest, I don't think my standards matter because I'm not lending you the money. <laughs> but to be honest, from the credit rating agencies' standards, anything that is in what they would call, I think on Experian, good is about 890, I believe, or 900. Because I know 879 is still in the fair. So about 880 to 890 would be good. So um, to, like I said earlier, though, as much as the score's important, I'll just encourage everyone to focus on your actual history and the report in itself. You know, don't just go on the credit rating agency sites and, you know, look at the score and say, yeah, it's all fine. Look through the history. Take some time in your day to look through everything, not only just to in ensure that you're making all your payments on time, but also to ensure that there's nothing on there that you didn't actually apply for. And also to ensure that the information that is recorded on you is actually correct. Yeah. Absolutely. Just a couple more before we end at, at 10.30. Um, if you take out a loan to pay off your credit, um, then pay off the loan on time, would that help? So I guess that's um, referring to consolidation. Yeah. So that's more like a debt consolidation where you're taking out one debt for another. Would that help? Well, firstly, initially, like I said earlier, if you take out a loan, your credit score is going to go down. So you can expect that immediately because you're taking out a new lending facility, which, you know, has no history of being paid off. Um, if you then use that to pay off all your credit, so if you then use that to pay off your credit now, you might see, the thing is, you, you might see a slight increase or 
it might stay quite stagnant because where even though you're paying off your credit, which is going to increase your credit, you've also, in a sense, done something that's going to decrease your credit. So you won't see that much of a crazy increase. It would help over time. So, of course, if you pay, if you take out the loan, pay off your debts and then also then start making payments on the loan. After, after a few months, you will start to see more increases. But at that initial moment, you won't see that much of an increase because you've done something in the positive but then you've also done something that brings your credit score slightly down as well amazing amazing um if we can take um a pause on the questions now we'll, we'll carry on with the ones that are here and then but if no more if no more can come through um we can um we'll give you details on how to get in touch with um with um clarence yeah going forward. But let's just finish off these ones right here um is it possible to get a mortgage while receiving long-term sickness benefits it's possible to get a mortgage on benefits. So ideally, most lenders would only look at employed income. And it depends on the circumstances of that um, agreement with the employer. So if you are on long-term sickness and you know you have a contract and you're still getting full pay, it is something that is definitely worth speaking to a broker about because there's no right or wrong answer for that or no one-way answer. Some lenders might be willing to look at it because, for example, if you're on the application with somebody else who also does have a full-time income, then it might be you know, possible to look at the application from experience. But initially, they would want to see full-time employment because what would also come into play is how long you'll be receiving that for. You know, As you can imagine, when you take out a mortgage, well, most of the time, the mortgage term is about 20 to 25 years so if you're only going to be receiving those um, sickness benefits for you know let's say two to three years there's a possibility that they'll say you know what that's not going to be possible because it's not going to stretch on for the time of the mortgage so when you're no longer receiving those payments then what's going to happen i hope that um, i hope that makes sense love that um so if the history is bad and we've made over a million in trading that year will the mortgage lender be inclined to consider lending based on the bank balance um, I'm going to take that one if that's all right. Um, yeah, go on, yes. Um, so, yes, you know, you've, you say you've, you've made a million in trading, so your bank balance is looking good. Um, it doesn't help with your credit file, but what it does help with is your deposit or your, I mean, if you made a million in trading, maybe you can buy the house cash, but maybe you have, if the house is more than a million and that's just your deposit, which it must be if you're looking to get a mortgage. Um, so I guess the question is, I guess the answer is, you'd have a bigger deposit and the bigger deposit you've got, then again, it comes down to trust. So because you've got more skin in the game, so to speak, because you've got a bigger deposit, so you've got more to lose yourself, then the lender is going to have more of an appetite to lend to you. So the bigger your deposit, the less of a magnifying glass they're going to put over your credit history because they're like, well, yo, well, okay, well, you've got more skin in the game. See, what we do as brokers is we have like a matrix to look through. And one of the things would be, okay, how big is the deposit? Oh, it's large. If it's large, then when we're now looking at credit score, they're like, okay, they're going to be more lenient because they're like, this, this person's got more skin in the game. Um, I don't know if you want to add anything to that, CK. Yeah, no, that um, sounds absolutely fine. That's literally exactly what it is. That's literally word for word what it is. Amazing. Um, why is it so hard to get a mortgage when you're self-employed? Um <laughs> Yeah, um, it's, I, I, wouldn't, yeah. I wouldn't say it's hard. It just depends on the circumstance of your self-employed. For example, if you started a business last month and you're now self-employed, yes, it's going to be hard because most lenders want to see years of accounts. But it just depends on how your, <laughs> how your paperwork is positioned because, you know, I'm not, you know, I'm not, or I wouldn't encourage this at all. But a lot of people who are self-employed would rather pay less tax. <laughs> now, when you want to pay less tax on your self-assessments, it registers you with lower income. And if you look, if you see how that can kind of be counterproductive, when we're doing your mortgage, we're looking at your income. That's what a lot of the time makes it harder when people are self-employed trying to take out mortgages, you know. So as long as you're, um, you have your years of accounts and, you know, you're registering all your income and everything's on the self-assessment and it's all gone through the system, then it should be absolutely fine. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, so, like, to, to, to your accountant, you're poor. To your mortgage broker, yes. you're rich. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. That's the exactly. problem, right? You know, so yeah. just do your self If you know you're getting a mortgage, then start thinking about your self-assessment. Start thinking about your SA302, your tax returns, because self-employed self people notoriously want to make everything look very small, 
But then when they get a mortgage, exactly. they want it to look good. now it has to look big, yeah. Yeah, so Literally. just kind of bear that in mind. Again, if you're trading, a lot of people would like to use their trading income to help them get on a property ladder. That's fine, but then you're going to have to declare it. You're going to have to declare it and, and pay the tax on it. Yes, um, exactly. Let's wrap this up. Regarding having a student loan, is it better to pay it off in a lump sum, assuming you can afford it, or continue to pay, pay the bare minimum? My answer to that would probably be controversial. Yeah. But yeah. what would you say, Clarence? I to be honest, I would, I would recommend paying it off really? bit by bit. Yeah. Oh, I yeah, would, same, I, yeah. I wouldn't be yeah, able yeah, to pay it off in a lump sum. I wouldn't, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't do the lump sum. No, because the interest rate's so low, you might as well take advantage of exactly. it. Exactly. You might as well stretch it on and even just for a point of cash flow, you might as well just stretch it along um, and just pay it off bit by bit. And if you can afford those payments every month, you're trying to get a mortgage, you can afford both payments, then yeah, why not? You know, the, the money that you were going to use for the lump sum, you could put that towards your deposit or towards, business. you know, or business or, you know, something else. So, yeah, I definitely would definitely recommend paying it off. Whenever something, is, whenever something is low, low interest rate, that's why you see a lot of people getting bounce back loans because interest rates yeah. are so low. People are like, well, if I'm yeah. only paying this amount of interest, but this potential venture could get me yeah. this, then you're starting to be smart with, 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 with lending. Exactly. Okay. Got the address in there. Okay, it's an interesting one from Joyce. I'm not sure how true this is, but apparently your race affects the interest rate the banks give you. So if I lie about my race, would I get a lower interest rate? Interesting. To be honest, I've never heard that before, Joyce. And I don't think that is the case either. Um, well, I hope that's not the case, but I really don't think it is. Um, the reason I can say that is because, for example, from being a broker, we look at the system and the rates that come up for example, if you came into my office and we had an appointment, I would flip the screen around and say, look, these are the rates available. So I don't, I don't think that's, that's necessarily true, no. Absolutely. I remember banks, yeah. and banks actually want to, you know, they want to do business. They want to yeah. uh, they they do mortgage. Yes, they want business. to give you money. Yeah. Give, yeah. As long as you can pay it back, they do want to lend you the money. Absolutely. Okay, so um, Clarence, I just want to thank you for your time. Thank, I know you're a very busy guy. I know you're, in, you're high in demand. I want to no thank worries. you for coming on to give you value. Just before I, I really kind of hand, hand back to you, um, I just want to say, guys, if you're listening to this and you're going through a situation right now, if you're going through this and you, put, you feel like the world's on, on top of you, you feel like the world's caving in, maybe you're going through a really bad time financially, credit-wise and so forth, I want you to know that there's light at the end of the tunnel. You know, I'm sure there's people on this call that have been there and they've come through the other side. You know, I just want you to know that, that there's definitely light at the end of the tunnel and that it's not, you know, it's like seasons. What you're going through now is, 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 is like winter. But after yeah. winter comes spring, you know, so don't let this thing, you know, get on top of you. Sometimes we can make our financial situation seem so bad in our head. And then in years to come, you'll look back you'll look back on this time that you're going through now and you know, you, you'll think, why, why was it such a big thing? Why did I make that such a big thing? You know, you will get through it guys. So there are professional services such as step change, um, step change, the national debt advice service. Okay. Professional people that you can speak to, but never ever let the situation get on top of you. Clarence gems yeah. as always, absolutely fantastic. Um, guys, if you got value from Clarence's session today, can you just blow up the chat box, guys? Because, wow. <laughs> wow, 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 wow. Um, if you would like Clarence to come back, put a, a seven in the chat box, guys. If you would like Clarence to be a weekly feature talking about different topics, because this was just credit. That like he, he, he could, he's got a whole bag of different topics. Put an eight if you'd like him to be like a regular feature, you know, every single week. Oh, wow, Clarence, wow. <laughs> what do you say, I'm my to, friend? I'm about to talk about a contract, this. <laughs> <laughs> no, I appreciate that. I'm not sure if this is a good time. <laughs> I'm not sure if this is a good time to tell Clarence that he's not getting paid for this session. <laughs> um, <laughs> I see that, guys. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> you know that warm glow and fuzzy feeling you get when you give back? That's what you're going to get. No, of course, definitely. It's and worth this is why we do it, honestly. Um, silver and gold. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Oh, Joyce wants you back every day. Every day? Every day. 
I'm flattered. <laughs> Here it comes up. Amazing, no, no, amazing. amazing. So once again, I want to thank you. thank you. Um, will you come back next week? What, what could you talk about next week, Karis? Next week, I think in, I think today we touched more on the credit and preparing for the mortgage. So what I'll say, Des, is I know you do these calls quite a lot. So maybe if you can do like a little poll with everyone and just see what will be good for them to hear what they're interested in hearing. Because I know there's some people that might have wanted to ask questions and we kind of had to shut it off. So maybe just let me know what people want to hear about. And yeah, we can, we can, we can, we can go with it, man. Brilliant. Uh, Tim, would you it. mind conducting yeah. that poll? Um, yeah. I'll get Tamer to do, um, do that poll if that's all right. Um, yeah, fine. Um, we'll come back because this guy, he, he knows so much, so valuable. Guys, I want to respect your time. I want to respect your time. I look, for, I look forward to next week. Um, guys, you, if you're on here and you're a guest, if you've been invited here by somebody, because this is open, you know, if, you, if you're here as a guest, I want you to know that this academy will change your life. From sessions like this to being able to make money from the foreign exchange market from being able to do drop shipping, networking, like it's just so much value in this academy. If you're here as a guest, I want you to come on board and be part of the family. We, we want to welcome you to the family. Um, and guys, next week, be, feel free to invite guests on here. Um, just let them get a little flavor of, of what we do. Um, but at, by the end of it, please follow up with them and let them know that, you know, come on board. Guys, that being said, have a great evening. Have a great evening. Thank you very later. much for having me. me. Um, this would be worth it. Thank you so much. Oh, wow. What feedback. Wow. Thank amazing. you, Joyce. That's amazing. It's incredible. That's amazing. Thank you. Do you follow Clarence on um, his Insta at I'll just put CK it Talks yeah. Money. Does yeah. lots of lives and so forth. We only know what we know and we don't know what we don't know. Thank you, Clarence. Appreciate your time. You're welcome, Des. Thanks for having me, man. No, no. Thanks. You're now, you're not, we can't call you a guest anymore. Now you're a resident. <laughs> resident. You're a resident. So I believe you're on your way to P150. I believe someone, you got someone. Got I someone, am, yeah. Sign up today, right? Correct, yeah. So we're going to get you to P150. We're going to celebrate you. You're part of the academy now. You're just, That's you're it. part of the furniture. You're just, you know, just a regular That's guy. It. Love it. <laughs> All right. Love it, Des. Love it. I'm going to try and get this recorded out to you guys as soon as possible. So there's going to be way more watching this back. On, um, on the recording. So if you're watching this back on the recording, you know, follow um, Clarence um, on Instagram. Let's go, let's go, let's go. Take care, guys. That's it.